Okay, I think we will get started. And uh, so welcome to the college seminar series. I'm Marie Harvey, the Associate Dean, and I'm delighted to welcome you. Um, we are having people coming, people here in person. We have people on Zoom, and our speaker will be on Zoom. So um, I will allow Kate to tell you more about those of you who are on Zoom, how to participate in the Q&A. But what I would like to do, and I'm delighted, is to introduce Kate Mac McTavish. Kate is an associate professor in the Human Development and Family Sciences program here in the college. And she has graciously agreed to introduce our speaker and to moderate. So, Kate, thank you very much. Thank you, Marie. And welcome, everyone. We're very excited that you're here. And I hope you're as excited about the topic as I am. Um, so if you are joining us um, remotely through the webinar, um, we will use the Q&A as a way for you to enter your questions for the speaker. So please, um, please feel free to go ahead and do that. We won't be able to unmute you in this particular format, but we'll read your questions out loud and make sure they get responded to. Right. All right, if you're here in the room, of course, you can just raise your hand <laughs> and join the conversation. We've got more people joining us as I'm talking. So Dr. Marissa Zapata is an associate professor of land use planning at Portland State University, where she is also the director of PSU's Homeless Research and Action Collaborative. Dr. Zapata earned a BA in anthropology from Rice University and an MUP in urban planning and a PhD in regional planning, both from the University of Illinois. Happens to be my alma mater too. As an educator, scholar, and planner, Dr. Zapata is committed to achieving spatially based social justice by preparing planners to act in the uncertain and inequitable futures we face. She believes that how we use land reflects our social and cultural values. Dr. Zapata will discuss why housing is central to health and essential to ending homelessness. Marissa will also examine what it means to demand housing within the health allied fields and how we could best engage with advocacy to end homelessness. So with that, Marissa, I will turn it over to you. Hey, y'all. Thank you so much. Um, it's funny because right now, the way that the camera is facing, I can see myself in the... <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> and I had to fight the urge to put bunny ears on you. <laughs> um, which may tell you my level of maturity in the general scheme of things. Thank you all so much for having me. And I'm super bummed I wasn't able to come in person. Um, so I really appreciate the flexibility of being able to switch to Zoom. We only have an hour together and there's obviously a lot I can say about homelessness. So I just wanted to start out with any burning questions that you have that helps me kind of get a sense of where the audience is at and thinking about and talking about homelessness. It's also fine to not have questions. I know it is Friday afternoon at 1 p.m. and I don't know if it's supposed to be as hot down there as it's gonna be here, but I fully appreciate that maybe people need to be on autopilot for a bit. Okay, so one thing I ask is um, for you to really think about and then and come back to and reflect on whether you believe that every human being has a right to housing. So just think about that. I don't need you to answer it, but really sit with that because I think a lot of us on instinct will say yes, particularly those of us who are in some sort of social justice oriented or caring type of profession. Uh, but as we see in the public and the public debates, it's not as easy as that. And um, and I think that that is something that to really try to reflect on is when we start to talk about homelessness and we start to think about who deserves housing comes up almost immediately. And that is foundational to our country, right? And so our country is rooted on the belief that some people deserve housing and some people do not. And in the start of the country, the people who deserved housing were white, presenting heterosexual, presenting cisgender men of a certain economic class, religious background. Um, women could not own property. African-Americans were deemed property and Africans were deemed property. And Native Americans were dispossessed of their land and experienced a genocide. 
And so we already have started the foundation of even a conception of who has a right to a place to live in a very particular direction. Now, over time, we did actually try to think about um, making sure we were investing in what some people call public housing, some people call social housing. Um, and you know, through the early 1900s, we did start to increase that investment and to think about that everyone needs that kind of housing, you need some kind of housing. Um, but that notion of dessert was still there, right? So who actually is able to stay in housing? How much are we gonna invest in that? Are we gonna upkeep that housing? Simultaneously, we went in really strongly with a commitment to housing and property as an investment. So I think most of us might know at this point that our retirement funds include real estate portfolios now. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us might bemoan these large investment firms snapping up housing and then renting it out or redeveloping it to sell it at higher prices. But our retirement funds in some cases are tied to the success of that. Um, you know, some of you might know that if you use the, the the actually largest housing subsidy in the country is the mortgage interest tax deduction. So if you have ever taken that tax incentive, you are receiving the largest government subsidy by far in the country. People don't often know that the number of people who are taking that interest deduction, particularly now post um, Trump's reform on taxes, were, is actually people who are upper middle class to wealthy. So most people who are average income and own a home aren't even using that deduction. And in Oregon, we still have the ability to claim a second tax reduction based on having a second home. So we are giving away money and subsidizing people with wealth. And yet those folks would never say for a second that they receive a housing subsidy because the housing subsidy is framed and understood as something that goes to poor people and only poor people who deserve it. Now, if you're like, why are we talking all of this about housing? Well, we wanna talk about homelessness and in the context of homelessness, housing is what matters most. And if you're starting to feel like, but wait, we're health, like we wanna get engaged, we have all these ideas. Yes, we're excited to have you engaged now. I mean, some of you may have already been engaged, but I'll just say the hospitals are coming in hard right now. And it's really great to see so many people wanting to engage, but also fundamentally while housing matters to health, housing is not solved by health. Housing is its own system. It's its own profession. It's its own way of thinking about how you do things. Like y'all wouldn't want me cruising in and being like, I know how to do public health. Here's the 55 ways to do it, right? we're starting to see some of these challenges as it presents in the community. Um, before I go any further, I do want to acknowledge that almost always there is somebody in an audience that I speak to that is or has experienced homelessness or serious housing insecurity. And I want to hold space for those experiences. Some people might still be experiencing that. I'm assuming that most students are at least some degree unstably housed because of um, income, student loans, and so forth. And that is real. Um, so talking about this can feel very alienating when it's in this kind of space. So I just want to acknowledge that people who are living this experience or who have lived it are what drives my actual work. All right, so some fun numbers. I'm gonna go through some cute slides. Um, I also want to acknowledge that, you know, this is stuff that can be hard to talk about. Um, I'm sure that y'all have tough conversations all the time. But in spaces where it's new or it's just continuing to talk about things that are very sad, um, it can be very, very hard to um, to not feel like it's overwhelming. And that's okay, right? I don't know what your visible homelessness looks like in Corvallis, um, but in Portland, it's really heartbreaking right now. It's really rough to see people in camps, how they're living, and what choices they're being forced into or not. So I just want to you know, say that is a very real experience. Being angry, being sad, being frustrated is very real. And I have to come back to that sometimes because it's very hard to be angry at an amorphous government. 
And so again, we have to just remember where we're going to center this and and where we want to just try to find ways to actually improve things. Okay, one of the most complicated things to start with is that the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has a very specific definition of homelessness. It includes people who are in emergency shelter, something called transitional housing that most people, it's, it's a category, it's a funding stream. Um, and then of course, um, thinking about people who are unsheltered, living in cars and tents, warehouses, things that are not meant for human habitation. Um, that is the bulk of where federal funding is routed through. It does not include people who are doubled up, unsafely, tripled up. That is a definition that the Department of Education uses. It is also a definition that DHHS uses. And so it's important to think about who is actually considered homeless, particularly when we start looking at our evidence base and our data. So if you see any data coming from HUD, you are getting a very small snapshot of homelessness. I actually met with another group this week and hadn't really thought about uh, people who have come over to seek asylum and are now um, staying in motels because they don't know anyone here are in fact experiencing homelessness because they're waiting for their court date to find out if their asylum will be granted or not. Uh, so we're always thinking about these other populations that HUD is not really thinking about. Um, the big thing is that people are always surprised to see that homelessness is actually going down in a lot of places. And it is hard to imagine because of what we see outside. The West Coast has a much higher rate of um, unsheltered homelessness than compared to the East Coast. And so when we see homelessness happening, we do tend to see it outside. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of academic theories right now about maybe this is saying something about people's um, feelings of right of claiming space, right? Is there a theoretical way of talking about people not feeling like they need to hide? Um, in Portland, we also know that you know, people who are maybe squatting in warehouses have been kicked out because of redevelopment in lofts, I mean, lofts or real estate opportunities. Um, I've got, uh, this is old data. Uh, and one of the things I like to point out is that nothing changes all that much over a couple of years. What you're really looking for is the big changes. And part of this goes back to a housing argument, which I'll get into in a second. So this is statewide data. These are the kind of data sets that you'll see and look at if you're really engaging in homelessness or you're hearing people talk in homelessness. They're gonna be talking about how many beds are available, how many people are utilizing shelter versus the number of people who are unsheltered, what the system capacity is actually looking like. Um, the We just released the 2023 point in time count numbers for the Tri-County area, and um, the utilization rate is up. The number of beds available are up. The number of people who are unsheltered is up. But the number of people, and so it's these very complicated, you know, we've got more capacity. We've got more people occupying capacity. We still have people who are increasing capacity. It gets very, very complicated. Um, Washington County and Clackamas County, which are in the Tri-County area, did see decreases, particularly all three counties saw decreases with chronic homelessness. And chronic homelessness is where a lot of, I think, people engaged in health really start to, to, to see a, a shared um, research agenda and shared practice around homelessness. All right. So we get into a lot of stereotypes about the cause of homelessness, who experiences homelessness. And again, this is driven by what we see on the street. Um, if even we're thinking about the HUD definition, the most restricted definition of homelessness, the rate of serious mental illness in relationship to mental health is not significant. And we see this consistently. There is a small subset of people who are experiencing some sort of serious mental illness, some sort of substance use disorder, um, trying to manage that. And obviously people are in dire straits, but that is not what causes homelessness. We also know that some people will actually acquire mental illness or acquire substance use disorders on the street. So you can hear countless stories of people going to the hospital to seek care because 
they were beaten or they fell downstairs or their body hurts from sleeping outside and they're immediately profiled as drug seeking. And so they're denied access to medication that they might desperately need. And look, somebody on the street offers them a way to ease their pain. Um, I like to say that during the winter, I like to have like that extra whiskey drink because it's warm, right? So you're outside and maybe that becomes a more than an occasional extra whiskey drink. We also know that, you know, just sleep psychosis is real. And some serious mental or mental illnesses that were on the cusp might become more serious, but that once people move inside, those can resolve. So mental illness as a cause has not been demonstrated, right? Instead, it, we do see presentations of serious mental illness on the street, but it is not what hits people in a homeless situation. Um, so right now, if we're talking about the fact that we do see really serious substance use disorders in Portland, um, we know that the fentanyl issue is real. We have much more serious addiction than we said we saw four years ago. Um, we also know that is including housed populations. So a lot of times people who are managing public lands like my own university will come to me and say, hey, we've got a bunch of people who are smoking fentanyl and tents on the property help us because you run the homelessness research center and i'm like well i can't help you with the fentanyl part because that's a mental health substance use disorder space i can help you with the homeless part because fundamentally homelessness is about housing and so we see consistently around the country that as real estate values increase and vacancy decreases, which isn't always perfectly lined up, um, we will see increases of homelessness. It's why Portland went from having homelessness to having a significant number of people experiencing homelessness. We see that because uh, people come in and buy apartment buildings that were naturally occurring affordable housing and suddenly evict everyone and then um, and then renovate the apartments and rent them out for much higher costs. Um, and so this is not uncommon. We actually now have state legislation that prevents that for our city regis legislation that prevents that in uh, Portland. But this is the reality, right? We've got, again, a market or a housing. Housing is still a capital investment and a market. And as long as people are not protected to stay in their units or the government does not regulate um, housing, then we're going to always end up in this situation that as housing prices increase, um, then uh, vacancy rates decrease, we are not going to be able to provide housing for people who make the least amount of money. Uh, to put that in a little bit further context, if most places in the state, if not all, to simply purchase materials and pay for labor to build a house or an apartment already exceeds people earning 60% of median household income, just materials and labor. I could give you land, I could waive all development fees. We have already priced out people at 60% median household income. Some people experiencing homelessness are at 30 to 60% median household income, some even up to you know 120% median household income. The majority of people experiencing homelessness are in zero to 30% median household income. So when we're thinking about what people are going to build or develop or acquire, we have already priced out almost everyone experiencing homelessness. What we then see from the experience of homelessness is these really terrible um, impacts, right? And I probably don't have to go into these in a great deal, but I did put the graphics together so I could show you the fun things and actually more importantly, share the sources with you. Um, right. So not surprisingly, homelessness is very hard on people's bodies. The longer they are outside, the more intense and severe that experience is. You'll see a lot of people who are living outside forced into places to stay that are on interstates or high traffic corridors. On one hand, people spend a lot of time talking about the likelihood of someone being hit by a car. I actually think the, the more prevalent issue is the exposure to auto exhaust and um, cancer causing agents. There's also now, of course, the issues with wildfire smoke and people being outside at that time during that period of time. Uh, let me question. 
Okay. Yes. So Shannon, great question. Um, the question of heartless homelessness is primarily related to gentrification. No, it was really related to the escalation of housing prices, which you might be thinking about as gentrification and urban planning. Gentrification means something very specific and is, um, so I, depending on where, what field you're from, it may be that you think of it as gentrification, but it's really just property values increasing and, um, and then, and then vacancy rates decreasing. Um, the point, the point in time counts. Um, this is a really great question about where people are from and if they're coming here houseless. The coming here houseless stereotype exists in every community in the country. Every city or um, town believes that people move to their city houseless for some reason, right? They've all invented their reason. The Oregon reason is we're too nice. We have too many services. Um, and what we find is that when we do ask that question on point in time count, um, it ends up being a very small portion of people are moving here houseless. Most people move here for the same reasons that everybody moves to Portland, which is friends, families, jobs, lifestyle, and so forth. The other thing to understand is that within the folks that are moving here without services, a set of them are going to be youth who have been um, removed from their house from by their families for not accepting their LGBTQI status or their identity. And so we see that we do see some people with serious mental illness who are brought by their families and then left at hospitals because they don't have the resources or capacity to care for them in rural communities. So, um, so it's never, it's, it's a lot more complicated than, um, than just did they move here houseless? Because really what people want to know is, are the policies where we have around homelessness making people come here and therefore we should stop them? Um, so yeah, so, but that is, that is a huge question. Every place, we all laugh about it when we get together because we're like, hey, we all, we all get asked this question and it's, it's fascinating. Um, Oregon is the only state that I think could be remotely justified in the stereotype feeling or being set in some kind of reality because the Rajneeshis did in fact bring people in who were experiencing homelessness um, 30 or 40 years ago. But other than that, there really isn't any um, encounters with that. Um, so yeah, so a lot of, you know, in, in, of course, in health is talking about these ideas of upstream causes and downstream causes. Again, this, this is not, these are not real causes. These are correlations with people who, um, who may in fact, um, have experienced a number of things, right? So getting into like ACE scores with, um, with ending up houseless. One of the misnomers, if you ask somebody what caused their homelessness, they might tell you, I couldn't get through to my caseworker or something like that. But it really often starts out 10 steps before, or I couldn't pay my rent. That's probably true, right? If we pay everyone's rent, they could stay in their housing. But what put them in that situation is often five steps back. And so understanding what's put people in um, into um, homelessness is actually a little bit more complicated than it seems. Uh, because people want to see how we save money on addressing homelessness, we do know for people who are what qualify for what is called permanent supportive housing, people who are in these situations with disability, qualifying disabilities and homelessness, we will see reductions in times of hospital stays, cost of care and so forth when they are in fact moved into housing because housing is what provides the stability to access and choose to engage in services. Um, so we wanna always just emphasize that this does have a cost savings where it matters one of the things I always caution, though, with the cost savings component is that um, cost savings, in some cases now we're seeing the cost savings aren't uh, actually as great as we thought because housing and real estate is expensive. Maintaining a housing stock is expensive. Paying staff their true value is expensive. And right now the shortage of behavioral health workers is the 
ex the largest external threat, I think, to whether we are going to be successful in resolving chronic homelessness um, in the next 10 years, because we just don't have enough people and people of color to do that work. Um, and particularly it's a nationwide issue, but particularly here in Oregon. Um, but I mean, some of this is common sense, right? If you've got someone who is living with schizophrenia, they don't have a place to live. Um, when you put them into housing, there is more of a chance that they're going to be able to manage their health care um, and so forth. So that gives rise to a model called permanent supportive housing. Um, permanent supportive housing is what it's described as. It is offering people a permanent place to stay and then offering them support services as needed. And so you were offered a huge range of services. Um, if you need additional services, then people work to get you those services. The big thing is you're not required to participate in the services um, most of the time, right? So it's really thinking about being able to support someone while they start to just experience living someplace, build trust with people and caseworkers and managers. People who end up homeless, understandably, don't trust that people are going to help them. Because usually by the time you get to homelessness, you have been failed multiple times. And so you really have to take a time to build those relationships and, and help people understand that you are safe and that you are someone who wants to actually help them. Um, so again, these are just starting to continually to demonstrate cost savings. Um, you know, the big marker for housing um, and homelessness is people staying in housing, so retention numbers. Um, there is no comparison to a permanent supportive housing model in resolving homelessness, particularly with the model called Housing First. Housing First is the model that is most dedicated to the idea that we should first and foremost be offering people a stable place to live, not forcing sobriety, not requiring participation in programs, that it is simply a place for them to live and to start sorting out their issues. It's also you know, important to understand that diagnosing people before they have been in housing for a little while can actually be quite hard to do because of the presentations of different behavioral health issues and mental health issues um, can look quite similar or overlap or reinforce one another um, until people are in housing. Um, again, we see these cost savings uh, like I said, I, I do think we just need to be cautious with using them. It's oftentimes also confusing to people because if you're looking at healthcare costs, odds are it's about saving Medicaid dollars and not necessarily dollars to a local jurisdiction. And so since I exist in the policy space, you know, does a county commission or a city commission care as much about cost savings to Medicaid? Then you have to demonstrate the cost savings in other spaces and it can get quite, quite messy. Um, and that's the bottom link is a link to more information about housing first. All right, I'm going to skip through data collection and data elements unless you really want to get into data. Um, and I just want to, you know, close with a couple of remarks around this notions of evidence. Um, it, it really shows up as, and I think as health has developed more interest in whether it's public health or um, hospitals or health insurance companies, the Medicaid waiver, of course, is pretty game-changing for Oregon to be able to try to explore um, how Medicaid funding can help address homelessness. Um, and, and to some degree, even the social services and homeless services, I actually find a very hard time working with sometimes because a lot of these models are really focused on interventional individual intervention, whereas housing as a system is a community-level intervention. And so what does it mean for a housing project or a housing intervention to work? But we're talking at a, a much larger policy scale than how we think about how to individually improve a program for someone. Um, you know, I think I think the case in point, I was at the National Alliance and Homelessness. I'm on their research committee. I was on a call last week and people are like, yeah, I really want to understand how within this type of programming, this subpopulation fares. And I'm like, I love that question. I do a lot of that around racial equity, but that's not actually a housing question. That's about improving services to people experiencing homelessness and a particular kind of homelessness, very important. 
but it doesn't actually help us move necessarily to the question of how we make housing more accessible and how do we make housing, um, how do we have more housing, right? So we don't have sufficient units. If we know that the solution to homelessness is in fact housing, then why do we spend as much energy still on these other areas? And it's because we pick our professions, right? I'm not going to suddenly become a homeless service re services researcher because that's not what I did. And so how do we align and shift these discussions to be truly interdisciplinary, bringing the strengths of our fields together to lift up this, this need for housing, both in terms of the initial access, the prevention, and then getting enough units so that people can move back into housing while thinking about how do we support people who are experiencing the trauma, the physical effects of homelessness, building the relationships necessary to help people move inside. Um, the other thing is has been uh, when I've worked with health professionals, and this has shown up less with public health than it has shown up more with people who are um, you know, super clinically oriented, or who are in different spaces like in CCOs, is that there's notions about what does efficacy look like that we're just not gonna get to in homeless services. And so chasing the idealized way of researching what demonstrates effectiveness that I have seen in a lot of health projects, uh, we just don't have the data to do that kind of work. We don't have the kind of robust infrastructure for collecting that information and um, I don't think that that's actually an appropriate space for things, a, a use of money at this point, right? We have so many financial needs within the homeless system. I am going to choose every day to put more money into rent vouchers and put more money into uh, retaining staff and recruiting staff than trying to model what health does to have a massive data set at their um at their, at their fingertips um, frequently. Um, I think lastly, one of the things that we really try to think about in homeless services is the, the, the challenges with administrative data. And so really understanding that all of our administrative data sets are coercively, um, coercively co collected, right? When we go to the doctor, we're signing away our rights for our information to be used for administrative purposes and evaluation purposes. Um, for people who have had so much taken from them, even knowing that they are a row in a data set can feel very extractive and very vulnerable. And so really thinking about and working with people with lived experience to understand what does it mean to use those data? And then what does it mean to share those data? Because y'all, I cannot tell you how many conversations I'm in where everyone's like, let's link all the data sets together. We need Medicaid with um, the homelessness management information system data with HMIS, with this, with that, we'll link it to the school's data and we'll follow people around in the system. And I'm like, but to do what, right? And we know that algorithms, particularly in criminal justice systems have been used to harm people of color, whether that's intentional or not. Um, and we know that there is a danger in simply linking data sets together. So yeah, this, this set of commentary is very driven by my experiences with health um, Kathleen Conti, I think she's one of your alums, actually, um, is a senior research associate at Portland State University I mean, at the research center with us. And so we're, we're continuing to kind of map out these ideas about these intersections between housing, homeless services, and health, broadly put, to really try to make sense of where are our strengths and where can we come together on things. Um, so, you know, my thing is like, know what you don't know, right? I know, I don't know a whole bunch of stuff in this work. I'm constantly like, huh, I can't answer that question. Um, but I think one of the biggest things in health that can be done is to support and advocate and embrace the need for housing. It doesn't mean that, say, um, public health should be overseeing housing development, but some of the things are quite small. Like, does public health have a lot of land that they can be donating? So very infrastructure-based. Um, what are the roles of trying to get vouchers out? What about behavioral health? How does that fit in? And then uh, my last plea for at all times is be, just stop what you're doing and become a mental health care cl clinician because that's what we need the most of, period, in the practice. Um, so yeah, so those are just some thoughts. I'd love to hear reactions and um, questions.
I'm happy to answer anything. I like, don't feel like any question is dumb about homelessness. All right, thank you, Dr. Zabata. And we have a question here in the room. Yeah, she mentioned housing vouchers, and I've heard at least in this area and maybe some areas where how they might have housing vouchers, but if they don't have housing to put them in, they're not getting into them. And so I was wondering, how do you deal with that? Since I mean, you are sad and angry and frustrated, right? And I mean, that's the reality of this work. It's like everything, I mean, people will be like, oh, just you make it sound so simple. It's just about housing. I'm like, but it is. It's the reasons why we haven't invested in it that we have to examine. And that's where we come back to this question of, do we actually think that everyone deserves a place to live? Meaning, do we think that we are willing to redistribute wealth in a way that will ensure that there are housing units available? Part of why vouchers aren't helping is that as much as they could is that our the most of the urban areas in Oregon um, the significant or, or areas in Oregon are underbuilt for every income level. And that means that people with more money are renting at lower markets than they should be. And so there's nothing vacant. Um, but yeah, it's depressing. Sometimes you try to find it someplace, other city for someone to go live in. All right, we'll take one more in the room and then go to online. Thank you. I have a question and I have a comment first and then a question. The comment, you started out by talking about who is entitled to housing traditionally. And by the time you finished that, everybody you're trying to reach had already left. You were preaching to the choir. You alienated your your, uh, uh, the audience you were trying to reach just by saying those things at the beginning. I'd strongly suggest that you save those things till the end. Because if you start that way, you're going to lose a lot of potential audience. But my question is, uh, Biden is trying to relieve uh, student loan problems, and he's getting a lot of blowback from people who paid off their loans and feel they're getting punished if for these people who were basically scofflaws as far as they're concerned. Housing is a problem not just for the unhoused. It's a problem for everybody. So why aren't you concentrating on housing in general as opposed to housing these, this small group of people? You get a lot more support for that. Well, I was invited to give a talk to an academic audience in a school. So that's the talk I just gave about homelessness and housing. I definitely and obviously know how to give a talk based on my audience and how I want to reach people. I simply assumed that we were going to be in a space where certain ideas would be understood from the start. I also, as a person of color, do not feel like I have to completely moderate what my message is in order to reach certain people. There are certain people who don't want to hear my message, no matter how I package it or say it. In terms of housing, I mean, I think I made that point. We need housing for everyone. I don't focus on that. Homeless services does. And I think that is a detriment to homeless services advocacy, is that we need to be unified in an agenda to push for housing universally for everyone who needs it and the reforms that go with it. And that's where we get into these questions at intersections and how we can build an advocacy base to make that happen. Right. So, you know, in health, one of the things and one of the things I tell all fields is the most important thing you can do is pay your people a living wage, pay people a living wage. Also, don't fight zoning changes or don't fight restrictions on property development. Show up in what we call housing abundance in the housing community. But yeah, I mean, homeless services dramatically limits their conversation and their advocacy and can actually harm the efforts uh, to produce housing and for people who don't need PSH or people who are at different income levels. Great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to ask my own question. We're just trying to figure out if you answered the one that is in the... Uh... I think I answered it, but didn't clear it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's what we thought, too. Thank you. Thank you. So so thank you very much for this presentation, and I very much appreciate it. And my question is, I, too, am very concerned about the behavioral health workforce and the fact that it's, you know, in a crisis and that we do not have people of color trained. 
So I, I'm in, working here in public health. <laughs> so I'm trying to imagine how we can train our MPH students or students who are, are more professional uh, applied workers in public health to actually be able to help with that shortage because I believe that I think things that you don't have to be a licensed clinician to do things that can be helpful. So I'm trying to imagine how can we better train our MPH students maybe to understand in, um, trauma-informed care or social determinants of health and then also to be able to recruit a more diverse group of students who can go back to their community. So I'm open to your ideas. I project them. I hope if I'm taking you someplace you don't want to go, that's okay too. No, I mean, part of it's my limitations in answering it because it assumes that I know what you teach in it, a master's of public health. <laughs> and I know some of it, right? I actually thought about getting an MPH. I worked for Baylor Med School in um, disease prevention. So I, I have a little bit of an idea. And of course, Kathleen and I have talked about this a lot. Um, I think part of it is actually teaching advocacy and community organizing, yeah. right? So how do we mobilize? And thinking about that both in terms of how do we mobilize our profession? Yeah. Right. So I think that we often get caught up in value neutrality. I mean, I spoke at the a Kinsman Ethics Bioethics Conference that OHSU does every year. And I had to sign a presentation saying that I attested to I wouldn't present anything that was biased. And it was just such a bizarre way to enter a conversation, right? That was about <laughs> ethics. Um, and so I think that it is really thinking about, and this goes for all of the professions, right? We need to be thinking about organizing and advocacy. We need to be clarifying roles interdisciplinary, like in terms of interdisciplinary work, so that people who are getting MPHs or planning degrees or um, MSWs know where we fit in with one another to lift up that work. Um, the Oregon Housing Authority, I mean, um, Oregon Health Authority is actually launching uh, launching work right now um, under Governor Kotek to be thinking about the behavioral workforce pipeline. And I know particularly communities of color are always at the table to think about different models and different ways to do things. Um, so I think that if, if y'all aren't engaged in that conversation, figuring out how to participate would be fantastic. So we're very engaged. <laughs> Great, um, love it. Human development and family sciences, I know. And so uh, those of us in public health have been seeing a lot of these calls come out and that's precisely why it's on my mind. And I totally agree with what you said. I think we need to work together and bring our different perspectives and our different strengths to really move forward and solve these issues. So thank you. So the racial equity question, the racial diversity question, I am gonna, I will answer, because I think that a lot of white dominant institutions get it wrong by starting and stopping with money, right? And it is true, dollars recruit students universally, right? So thinking about how you prioritize those dollars first and foremost, going to students of color, but you also have to be an environment the students of color want to come to and stay in. Um, I went to Urbana-Champaign, rural community in the middle of nowhere. Um, honestly, if I had realized what it would be like to live in a white dominant community in a rural area in the Midwest, I probably wouldn't have gone. Right. I, I mean, I got to a campus where the mascot was a Native American chief and people were wearing T-shirts with headdresses on them. Um, but I also knew that I was getting into to some degree because I called, I uh, interviewed the, the admissions director and um, asked them what kind of support they provided for students of color. And he told me I didn't sound like a student of color who would need support and that my GRE schools were really good. So it's being mindful of the environment that someone is coming into and being realistic about what you can and can't do and being honest. Uh, in my research time and time again, I find that the most important thing to most people of color is to be absolutely honest about what you can and can't do. I think we have another Q&A. There's three. Two. Oh, three. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, if, since, since other folks can't see that, would you mind reading the question yeah. out to you? Thank you. What so steps can be done to combat NIMBYism when creating new housing? 
So fighting um, NIMBYism and so for those of y'all who don't know what that is, that is not in my backyard, not wanting people to move into their neighborhood, despite saying that they have compassion, that they want things to change. And again, this kind of gets back into what we were talking about with this whole philosophy around, do you really believe that people have a right to housing? Well, if you believe that people have a right to housing and you're not willing to put in enough money so everyone can buy a single family home, you actually have to support apartments going into your building, your neighborhood. You actually have to support designated affordable housing buildings going in, buildings that might serve people with PSH. Um, and so there are groups, there's a, a, a nationwide group called, um, that's the YIMBY movement. And they're all about trying to organize in communities to create um, their own, for every city to create their own YIMBY group. Uh, so Portland is called Portland's Neighbor Welcome, Neighbors Welcome. And they do a lot of organizing around NIMBYism. All right, next question. Thank you for sharing your recent blah, blah, blah. Thank you for the wonderful things. Um, a question about the strategy of publicly owned land or buildings being repurposed for housing. Am I understanding this correctly? Do you know examples of it on uh, how this could be advocated for? Yeah, so um, so there's property and I know I don't know of any examples in Corvallis. There actually, I think, was. Um, but certainly in Eugene and Portland and Salem, um, public land has been repurposed for creating tiny pod villages and creating sleep rest sites. So people are already doing that. Um, but in terms of housing, yeah, I mean, different public holding inst land institutions will donate land or lease land very cheaply for affordable housing. The place where you see that link the most is often with um is often with transit because of transit oriented development and in um, and then um, linking housing to transit. So it kind of depends on where you're living, uh, but certainly um, certainly you could probably tap into any conversation that's happening. Um, the other places that are really coming in strong with this and it's quite beautiful is our religious institutions. Mm -hmm. So there are actually now cohort models of institutions coming together to be trained in how to organize within their own congregations, within their neighborhoods, to say, we are going to use our map. I mean, sometimes the land holdings are massive. We're going to use our massive land holding holdings for safe pod villages, or we're going to use them to actually build housing. There's um, a church in my neighborhood that tore down an entire part of their building and have put in ap apartments and affordability ranges. So it's oh, yeah. it's showing up in very clever areas. Yeah. All right, next question. Homelessness is more than a situation. In many cases, it's a culture and people remain whole, houseless by choice because it's their thing. Should we be fighting against that culture or should we be coming up with ways to enable that culture without inconveniencing others? The number of people who truly want to stay homeless is very small. And again, this starts with the fact that we have a lot of people who just walk around and ask someone, do you want to stay homeless? And, you know, I don't know why people think this is a good research technique <laughs> because you're not likely to get a good answer. Um, it's also, if you are doing something more sustained, you're getting the answer often to the last experience of being housed, which may have been someplace that was rat infested or where a landlord was extorting someone for, um, for sex. Right. And so what you're, what you're not able, what you're not actually asking is the question of, what would it take for you to want to move into housing? And starting with that, uh, and someone might say no for 10 years and then be willing to take that chance because you have been asking that for 10 years. Um, we did a survey and, and sadly, one of the biggest barriers for people to move inside that they reported was not being able to see their friends and family freely because apartment buildings will have restrictions on visitors. Now, any of us who live on our own home or mostly even in condos, the idea that I couldn't have whoever I wanted over, however many people I wanted over, is preposterous, right? My neighbors might call the cops if I tried to cram 150 people into my house. But imagine being told that the people you are seeing daily, your support network, won't be admitted easily, if at all, to your home. And so really when you start to get into that, it's, it gets to be tougher and tougher. 
the other question about, right, like, I don't think it's enabling that culture, but helping people who are are really trying to think about moving back inside or going to need a lot of time to make that choice. I mean, yeah, I, I think that the reality is, is that people want to be left alone to do their thing. Um, I think that we will, that, that seeing visible homelessness will never be convenient for people who are housed. And particularly where that is going with, um, going along with visible people who are visibly altered in some way, right? So people who you look at and think they have some kind of, they're having some kind of mental health crisis or a substance use disorder, um, using drugs openly on the street is a, a big trigger for people. Um, and, and a lot of it is understandable, right? Seeing people in distress is scary. It's confusing. Um, and so I don't ever want it to negate that. Um, in terms of some of the inconvenience often being public urination and public defecation, it is about making sure that people have access to appropriate and effective hygiene facilities. Um, a lot of people, particularly in close in Portland, really want like a stationary hygiene center where they can go in, take showers, wash their clothes, see a healthcare provider, maybe get a haircut, right? So having service areas for people who, and this could serve people who are housed too, right? Like a lot of stuff serves many people. And then of course, trying to um, trying to make sure that we're also uh, collecting garbage regularly. So, I mean, there's so many examples where people will be like, oh, we've already tried that. And then I ask them, well, what did you actually do? And you're like, well, you can't really expect people experiencing homelessness to collect their trash and walk it 500 feet down the road to where you want to pick up everyone's trash because house people don't do that, right? So why are we why are we thinking that it's going to work better? <laughs> Anything that's for people experiencing homelessness is going to be harder because they're not living in an infrastructure environment that is set up the way that house people's lives are set up. Um, Lauren is recommending that people check out Outsiders. It's a podcast, which is a wonderful job of unpacking homelessness and some of the common questions that house folks wonder. It's an eight episode series. Just listened last week and highly recommend it. I will also plug my own podcast. Uh, if you search the website, I mean, Google's um, for answering, understanding homelessness, PSU, um, I have a podcast. We've gone on hiatus for a while, but we're going to start it again. Um, one of my favorite episodes is um, with a man who uh, was in a, what's called a speaker's bureau. So it was a training um, to do in some ways what the man at the beginning was saying, right? Train people to speak in a white dominant cultural way in elected spaces in particular, right? To tell their narrative in a way that is consumable to a white dominant elite elected audience um and he i mean he took to like that training i mean his the way that he tells the story is beautiful um but his narrative of how he developed a relationship with the outreach worker decided that he was willing to take a chance to move in housing and then is now in housing like i was interviewing him in his housing uh, it's just such a powerful story about what that looks like, as well as like some of the behind the scenes stuff that social service providers are doing. Great, okay, we've got one more question here in the room. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned early on that there is an increase in homelessness on the West Coast, but there's actually a decrease in other parts of the country. And what I have been hearing, I've been hearing from city leadership, city staff, that we're just too nice, exactly what you said. We are too welcoming, which is kind of hard to believe when you see what's going on. Why is it that there isn't a decrease in other parts of the country? Well, there is homelessness is increasing in, in many places in the country. And it's also decreasing in surprising areas like in Oregon, right? So overall, Oregon is really decreasing. The, the point in time count numbers got fiddled with a little bit. So it makes it look like there's a significant increase in the state and there's really not. Particularly if you look at like Multnomah County drives a lot of the numbers. Um, but there is there are increases like Atlanta, Houston's now going down, Austin. There's a bunch of Northeastern cities. It's just not visible because the East Coast really invested in shelter. 
and they have a so many gifts. Is it because they are investing in shelter? Is that it's, why the, it's going down? No, it's not going down. It's just not visible. Shelter, people who are in shelter count as being homeless as right. well. So it's just that unsheltered homelessness is not increasing the way it has on the West Coast. And, and on the West Coast, it is increasing because it's because it's more visible because we are not providing the shelters. No, shelter has nothing to do with oh, the rise and fall of homelessness. There, there's multiple types of homelessness. One is sheltered homelessness, and one is unsheltered homelessness. Um, you know, some in some places like in Multnomah County, sheltered homelessness went up, but part of the reason it went up is that they added hundreds more shelter beds. And so sometimes what you're seeing is these bizarre inflations that are actually, hey, we're serving people better. Um, unsheltered homelessness in Washington County went down quite a bit. And there are several theories for why that happened. Um, the comparison, the, the, the issue with the East Coast and the West Coast is that we, the West Coast has more visibility and the East Coast has more shelter that people go to. We don't actually want that necessarily because all that happened on the East Coast 100 years ago is that people didn't invest in housing. So we see, again, that what drives homelessness is a property value increase with a low vacancy rate. So any city in the country that is having constrained market availability with expenses going up, it's going to be seeing increases in homelessness. Phoenix was here yesterday. City officials from Phoenix were here yesterday. I don't know if you saw on the news, but they had a 900 person encampment they just swept and, um, you know, took apart. Um, and I was surprised to see that their vacancy rate is 4%. They don't have housing either. So any place that is dealing with this housing shortage is seeing it go up. We have one more question in the room and then I think we'll have to call it a wrap. Um, I'm a veteran. I volunteer with the uh, food bank and I focus on veterans getting into the services and uh, specifically homeless veterans. Uh, I seem to be able to, a little bit of rapport and I can get past some of the barriers, the anger barriers, et cetera. <clears throat> One of the barriers that I have is data collection mm -hmm. because the VA does not collect evidence, collects conditions which may mean nothing or something, I guess, how you approach this. Oh my God, uh, that is like the best summary of my life. It may mean something, it may mean nothing. I'm like the biggest, my biggest conclusion is always emoji shrug. <laughs> well, again, you know, we're, we're dealing with uh, a large institution, very large health uh, programs, mental health programs too. Uh, they they contend to put a lot of outreach specifically into suicide prevention stuff. But the latest report, um, th th their own internal report showed an absurd failure. Those are the two words they used across the board. And this is, uh, you know, all across the country. This isn't just here in Oregon, but Oregon was noted for certain things and specifically the rural urban divide. And this is the part of the data challenge that, that I'm really asking for is how do we get across this gap? Um, because if they're looking at one kind of data, like conditions, whereas all of the laws and rules and everything are based on evidence, how do you, how do you get past all this? How do you? So the VA doesn't collect like housing, days of housing or anything like that? They do. Okay, so what are you they looking ask for? Me, well, they they only ask it in terms of the conditions that they're serving. So, right. oh, like what's actually working for them? You mean like what's actually for, making the yeah, program work? Yeah, right for their program, but yeah. but it's not. But evidence is based on what's true or not to the veteran. So, for example, the VA could just simply <laughs> disregard all the evidence that shows that the veteran is in severe problems because it doesn't meet their conditions test. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, as researchers, there's not a lot that we can do. It is the advantage to linking to something like Medicaid, right? But it's where we end up 
and, and homelessness with a lot of small scale um, research evaluations. Right. And so it is, I, I'm actually working on trying to think of a data framework for the tri county region because we don't have enough of the information. And we do have these definitional conditions that really stop us from both knowing the effectiveness, but also qualifying people. So right. qualifying people for, again, like homelessness as a definition is so narrow. Um, one of the things that's really helpful right now in the Tri-County area is they've relaxed the definitional standard and what qualifies as disability or in need of PSH. But we aren't collecting anything more than, um, I mean, there's a few things more, but it's like the, 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 the outcome is always how many days that people stay in housing. And then everything else is a variable to help explain that. You know, are people of color more likely, blah, 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 blah. And that's all you ever know. You don't know anything else because they're not collecting it. So we end up, yeah, it's all very program evaluation based one at a time. And this is one of the questions that the we're asking both at the state and then in the Tri-County, what is worth the investment? So the Tri-County has a lot of money to invest in research and evaluation. But, you know, as a researcher, I'm like, there's 75 things I could know. Again, what is actually going to be worth the the hundreds of thousands of dollars it would take? I mean, I, I think it's going to easily be a few million to set up the dream system versus what is nimble enough to get up faster that outreach workers will actually put information into um, ways to bring in participant voice in a more consistent and rigorous way. Um, and I don't really know where that's going to fall. But it's like, it's one of the big things. I'm like, I don't, I really can't justify doing everything to the 10th degree. Um, again, also because if the, if what we need is more housing, then how much time am I going to spend and tell people to invest in um, individual level evaluation, which won't make any of y'all happy. But that's like part of my, my, it's part of my question. So I don't have a good answer for you. I just, I will confirm that it's crazy. And then if you, if you seem, I, I mean, I have a Twitter for a tweet, a tweet thread, Twitter thread from this week about the point in time count that I literally have an emoji shrug that I'm like, Hey, some numbers are out. Everybody wants to compare these. That's a real bad idea for a lot of reasons. Here's some trends. What do they mean? Nah, they could mean this. They could mean that. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Zapata. I, I think we all have a lot to think about, uh, given what you shared with us today. And uh, thank you all for coming. Yes. Thank you all for coming.